Welcome to Succession Stories. I'm Lori Barkman. As an exit value planning and M&A advisor, I call myself the business transition Sherpa. This podcast guides entrepreneurs from transition to transaction, from building value in your business to letting go. What do I do when I'm not hosting a podcast? I work with owners to maximize business value with my firm, Small Dot Big. And as a certified mergers and acquisitions advisor with Stony Hill, I guide you through the complex process of selling your company. Tune into Succession Stories for weekly insights to reward your hard work and avoid succession regrets. Hit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and sign up for our newsletter at successionstories.com. Here's to your success. Is this the year to sell your company? Don't leave your exit to chance. Stony Hill Advisors works with entrepreneurs like you to get ready for what may be the biggest transaction of your life. Learn what your business is worth by visiting stonyhilladvisors.com slash podcast. Welcome to Succession Stories Rewind. I'm going to rewind through the first 100 episodes and share some of my favorite clips with you. If you heard the 100th celebration episode, I mentioned some of the fantastic stories shared by next generation leaders, founders, and entrepreneurs. I'm selecting a few snippets to share with you today to spotlight the key themes of the show, innovation, growth, and transition. I'm planning to do a rewind periodically, so if you want to catch up on shows that you've missed, here's a pod hack for you. Enjoy this rewind episode of Succession Stories. One of my favorite conversations with Next Generation Leaders was episode 34 with Laird and Company. With an official founding date of 1780, Laird is the oldest commercial distillery and the 26th oldest family business in the United States. The company history of producing apple brandy stretches back to colonial times and George Washington. I spoke with Lisa Laird Dunn and her son, Gerard Dunn, the ninth and 10th generation family members in New Jersey. When it comes to bringing the next generation into the business, every story is different. But the best outcomes are when there is choice and fit on both sides of the decision. So you have an eye towards the future with certainly an appreciation of the past. You had mentioned in your introduction, Gerard, that you had, I think you said you swept floors and you did all kinds of things as a teenager. And we'll just assume the labor laws all worked out, but we won't go there. (laughs) (laughs) But how did you really get interested in working in the business? Was it something that it was just assumed you would do or was it genuinely an interest that you had and you had developed on your own? So from the start, I never really thought about it. I just worked here, as I said, for some extra spending money and during the summers. But as I came back each and every summer, my responsibilities increased. Eventually, I moved on from sweeping floors and cleaning under the machines. And don't get me wrong, I still even do that today. <laughs> but um, I started working in our accounting department in our processing where I was actually make, making the batches of liquor, worked a little bit in sales and marketing as well. So as I gained more responsibility, I gained a greater sense of pride. And the longer time I spent, I spent here, it's hard to explain. There's like an, an aura where I don't know if it's the history or if I think it's the history, but it's that greater sense of pride as I was touching on. And it just makes me proud to work here. And I was never assumed I was going to join the business. I think that's something my grandfather and my mother did exceptionally well. I was never, I never felt pressured at all until one day my grandfather just walked in my office, sat down and just straight up said out of nowhere. So do you think you want to join the business? And I said, yes. And then he got up and left the office. Not a word more was spoken. And it was <laughs> clear cut from there. That's it. That, done. That was it. Exactly. Done and that was the only time it was ever brought up. So I think they did a great job of not pressuring me. Lisa, what's your position on that from yourself? And then as you think about Gerard coming into the company, what were your thoughts? Well, obviously, I wholeheartedly wanted him to come into the company. And and I also have a daughter that hopefully someday she will come on board. Um, But obviously, I feel very strongly that it has to be their choice. It has to be their passion. Because if it isn't 
their choice or passion or what they want to do. It's not good for them and it's not good for the company as well. Um, luckily, my father took that avenue with me. I never felt pressured. So I felt it was also important that I didn't pressure my own children because I saw how I started one path and then I realized that this is what I wanted to do and it was my decision. And I think it's very important that you don't feel that pressure. So yeah, and I I was did this, I had pretty much had the same avenue that Gerard did, you know, worked here just to make some extra cash, you know. I uh, worked in um, quality control and production. And then when I finally um, decided to come in, into the company, I went into accounting and, and to sales and so forth, but which is pretty funny when I was younger and working here and, and working in production, we had an elderly gentleman called um, Jake Gunther. He'd been here for years and a local guy here in Colts Neck and he ran our processing. And he went one day went into my father's office and goes, do I have to listen to her? <laughs> and my father goes, yep. If she tells you something to do, you got to listen to her. He goes, okay. And that was it. And that was it. <laughs> Karen Norheim is the second generation president of American Crane and Equipment Corp, a specialized manufacturing company in Pennsylvania, founded by her father. This clip with Karen in episode 50 stands out to me because of our conversation about innovation in a mature company. In early 2020, at the start of the COVID pandemic, American Crane launched an innovation lab. I love how Karen talked about their philosophy of crawl, walk, run, as a framework for launching new technologies and how they view the importance of differentiation through innovation. We created the lab. We bought several different, I call them toys. They're not really toys. Yes, they are cool, but they are, they are things that I think can truly bring us business outcomes. But I put a team together, said, listen, here's your funding. Here's what I want you to do. You go figure out, here's your, here's your sandbox. Here's your white space, right? I'm not going to tell you which product, which project to go after. I'm just going to say, you've got my support and you've got my funding. Now you smart engineers who are way smarter than me. I'm just a Sherpa for people who are far more brilliant. Um, go and look, go forth, figure it out and come back to me. And it, it, my goodness, it worked so well. What they're coming back with is just incredible. And the speed, I thought some of the things that we would would do would take much longer. The speed at which they're going, the energy that's happening is really great. I think if you have amazing people, whatever industry space you're in, if you can create a, an area where they can have this sort of sandbox experience um, to, to look at R&D, look at innovation and find things that work. I mean, you, you put them together, really wonderful things can happen. And that's your job as a leader, right? Is to cultivate Absolutely. Absolutely. For organizations that are thinking, oh, wow, that's quite the investment. How do you get a return? How do you evaluate what comes out of the innovation lab in terms of what will move forward? I'm guessing out of 10 projects, maybe one will move forward, something like that. How do you measure? How do you forecast what might be successful and put it into place? Well, the the selection of the Augmenture software for our remote collaboration came out of the innovation lab. Um, the there we're using um, a tool called a Matterport uh, um, to look at taking 3D space models of our uh, overhead cranes because once they are installed, the, they are the permanent kind. And a lot of people when they think of cranes, they think of mobile cranes, not a mobile crane, but similar, picking things up, putting them down, but installed in permanent facilities. Um, you know, so that gives us a chance to kind of before it ships to know exactly where the electrical box was put on, where where's the conduit, and what does it look like. Um, that's happening. Um, and the the IoT and getting the smart crane technology put together um, is also in process. I mean, I would say that I I look to others to 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 really determine what I was going to put there. I put some really good seeds in. So like the seeds that they've got are pretty are pretty good. Um, but I would say what rose to the top for us was the smart crane and the IoT crane because we were fortunate enough to have an immediate situation where a customer was looking for that. So we paired both an immediate need with a long-term plan. Um, so that kind of helped to rise that to the top of the of the ba uh, barrel. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're looking at 
So I'm, so the engineer side of, I have engineers who are working on this with me. They're, they're looking at financials. Can, can we make this? Um, can we make it at a cost that we think we can integrate in? Um, is it feasible? And then at the same time, I'm looking at, okay, well, where's the market for this? Is this something that people need? What is it, t- what is it telling us out there? Uh, what are others doing? And kind of using that as the viability to, to determine that uh, return on investment. Do you talk with customers at any point in the discovery process in terms of their problems and how your innovations might help solve those problems? We have started to. Now, remember, the Innovation Lab just started in, in January of 2020. So we're just coming around our, our first year. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely engaging with some customers on that. Uh, and talking to them specifically. Um, we also, we have additive manufacturing. We, we do th- uh, the 3D printing with Onyx uh, um, uh, material and also with plastics. We've already put those pieces on our crane. So we're solving immediate problems for customers using that and just knowing how to um, use a additive machine to put something on a crane for perhaps like the, the government or the Navy or something like that. I mean, that's a big deal, right? You feel like you, you need to know what you're doing. So us being able to, to just walk in that space walk and and find ways to um, to utilize it has been huge. And then that opens the door for the running phase. So I always say with technology, you crawl, you walk, and then you run. And so with a lot of the stuff in the innovation lab right now, we are walking, um, but we hope to select a few where we really are, are running at them. And, um, you know, it's all coming. Well, your company is already, it seems to me anyway, so differentiated. I don't know exactly how differentiated you are for your competitors, but I would guess there are ways and that these innovations are going to put that proverbial moat around the right. castle even more. You know, Warren Buffett likes yep. to look, look for that moat. And is that part of it too, that you see that this is going to solidify how you differentiate in the market? Yeah, I mean, so so when we talk about smart cranes and internet things cranes, we have made automated cranes, you know, back in the early 90s. You know, we have done technology that would now be considered a smart crane, or, you know, in the last 20 years for different applications of nuclear power plants or in with, um, you know, different with NASA, different, different high um, quality um moving very expensive things around right so we so we we've had those experiences so part of the innovation lab was me just pulling together these smart individuals who don't realize that they have this this nugget of amazingness right and 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 just let you know pulling them together and saying hey we can do this we already do do this we just need to pull all of the strands together and make it into sort of a, a cohesive uh a unit um and that is who we are so so in our industry if we are the ones that people come to when nobody else can solve it. We can, we can solve it. You know, th- those tough, tough problems of material handling come to us. Um, and that is why the people that we do work with, the customers that we have, that's what I think differenti- differentiates us is that we take it as a partner um, all the way to the end of your project. We're gonna work through all any issues that happen. You can't predict anything, everything, um, whether it's COVID coming in and causing some problems, whether it's, you know, issues with the supplier chains, or whatever, we, we will work to make sure that our customer gets it. And then on top of that, we are the experts. So we know the technical background. We, we are fully designed in-house. You know, all of that is done in Pennsylvania, built in the U.S. You know, all of those pieces come together. So I feel like that and then coupled with craftsmanship because we really are craftsmen and there's a lot of quality that goes into our equipment. We don't believe in building things that are going to fall apart. We believe in building things that are right for the application um, and reliable and safe. Um, yeah. So I feel like those are all the things that differentiate us and and uh, yeah, I mean, I the, I kind of have joked before, even just on the cultural side, back to the Grip Matters piece that Grip Matters and the great logo was me just putting, you know, the cool shirt and logo on the people who were already amazing, already, you know, hitting it out of the park, you know, really ha- had grit and were all these things. It was kind of helping them to see themselves that way and, and kind of reflecting that externally, not just internally. Who is your most important customer? The person who buys your business. Stony Hill Advisors works with owners to maximize the value when you're ready to sell. Get started today with a business valuation by visiting stonyhilladvisors.com slash podcast. A common theme across many of my episodes is that all entrepreneurs will leave their company someday. 
Entrepreneur Steve Peplin is the founder and CEO of Talon Products, a manufacturing company in Ohio. I chose this clip from episode 69 because I love how Steve discussed the concept of a business scorecard and how he tracks different measurements to improve the company, especially using enterprise value as a benchmark. And I also appreciated Steve's honest answer when I asked him about succession planning. Maybe you can relate. Yeah. One of the things that I'm guessing has worked for you has been your attention to the numbers, even just as we've been talking in prep for this show. You know, I could tell that you are someone who studies the market. You understand your industry very well. You understand where you compare to your peers and you measure things, right? As a company, it's important, especially when you're measuring things like safety and quality. So I want to talk to you about that, what we call KPIs or, you know, key performance indicators. Another thing I saw on your website, it says, if it doesn't add value for the company, don't do it. So I want to ask you about this. What measures do you track for the business and that you think have really been part of your success over these years? I mean, there's so many, you know, it's funny. uh, We probably have, I mean, just in the sales and marketing department, we have 25 things we measure every year. Uh, every maybe a week, you know. So I mean, there's so many metrics, but when, when manufacturing, there's kind of a mantra that says, "What gets measured gets improved." I mean, it's not just manufacturing; it's in business. But uh, so, so yeah, we we. I also have a saying about that. I said we have a lot of data, but discerning knowledge from the data is hard. I mean, ha- tracking all this data is is uh, is only the first step. You have to understand what it means and uh, con- convert the data into knowledge. You know, that, that's, that's where it gets tricky. Um, you know, on-time delivery, quality, safety, uh, turnover. You know, th- these are the kind of metrics that are kind of basic to manufacturing, uh, all of which we excel at. We, we have, uh, we're in the top. Uh, I mean, we benchmark against the industry, you know, through, through our manufacturing association. So we see the numbers, you know, and, uh, and we're, 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 we're rock stars. I mean, we really do have a, a high-performing company. I what like, about enterprise value? Have you measured what the company is worth, gotten yeah. official valuations or, you know, kind of looked at it? And I think you, you and I sort of met in this M&A, yeah. mergers and acquisitions event that was online, and I had reached out to you afterwards. And so I know you spend time in those circles. Talk yeah, about that. You know, I look at that as kind of the ultimate scorecard. Um. So I, I am always aware of our market value of the company, of the enterprise value of the company, because that's the ultimate scorecard. I mean, uh, not, I'm not selling the company right now, but uh, you know, it, 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 you know we, we want the company to be profitable, which is, of course, one of the main metrics. I mean, people buy companies for future cash flow. I mean, that's a, basically the concept. You know, you're buying the cash flow of the company. Um, so it's, but it's not just cash flow that makes a company valuable. You know, it's culture. There's a lot of intangibles. It's the market served. There's so many other intangibles that go into other, other, other components. You know, is the owner necessary? Is the owner, does the owner have to be there? Is he intrinsic to the success of the company? Or does the company run itself and a new, new, com- a new owner could come in and step right in and, and, and maybe even, and also what, what, what is, what's left? What, 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 what's the next big thing that the new guy can do? You know, there's, there's so many aspects of it. Um, but I, I think that's, that's kind of like the ultimate KPI is <laughs> your, your net is your, 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 your enterprise value. Yeah. I mean, for you and the other, there's one other owner, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Your business but, partner. And so, yeah, by far, it's probably the largest asset you both have. It, it is. Yes. It is. It is. And uh, I mean, here's a good thing about growing older. When I was young, it was, it was 90% of my net worth, you know, but as I get older, it becomes less because, you know, we're profitable. We make money every year and I invest that. I diversify my investments. I have a diversified portfolio. Right. And uh, so it's funny, my, my financial advisor, we, we go, we talk about that. Like how much of your net worth is still in talent? You know? That's um, important for diversification. Yeah. yeah a lot of, is, a lot of business is. owners, this is sort of where they start, which is the financial planning side and understanding what is it that they need for the future when they retire, what that lifestyle they want to have. Do they want to travel? Do they want to buy another company or start another business? And then that, and then that sense of, well, where is the company today? What's it worth? And then is there a gap 
And all those factors that you just talked about, which are the things that help determine, well, what is the value? How does it compare against your peers? And ultimately value is in the eye of the acquirer, right? It's in the eye of the, of the other buyer. It's also an element of multiples. Ch- I mean, now there's the, the, the market for uh, M&A is so frothy. It's white hot. You know, I mean, there's, there's too much money chasing too few of opportunities. It combined with the dem- demographics of the baby boomers, guys my age, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the peak of the baby boom gr- bubble going through. I'm the, I'm the rabbit going through the snake's belly, dem- <laughs> demographically, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm getting to an age where, you know, you're looking at that stuff. So uh, the, the, uh, the, it's a, it's a, the, the, the multiples, of, the multiple of EBITDA, which is you know, a, a way to value companies, um, the multiples are climbing. I mean, for the, the, the funds have so much money that's they have dry powder. They got to they got to use it or lose it. Uh, there's 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 uh, a lot of a lot of a lot of demand. It's more demand than supply of companies now. So so when I when I use EV as a as a, as a metric or a KPI, I have to kind of remove that variable because you know we don't get credit for companies selling for higher multiples. I mean, that's not something we did. That's what society has provided us. Yeah, so now's a good time to sell for that reason. Well, also, there's a lot of discussion around other alternatives, such, such as ESOPs, for mm-hmm. companies that are large enough to try to garner the tax benefit. So oh, yeah. it is a very interesting time, as you say. There's a lot of dynamics and, and there's a lot of activity. So I want to talk about succession for a second. Do you have a succession plan in place? Whether it's, uh, call it the contingency, you know, more of an emergency, that's different. This is more yeah. kind of long-term, you know. Yeah. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it needs work. All entrepreneurs leave their companies. Some- During the first 100 episodes of this show, succession has often come up as a topic of conversation. Of course. That's why I chose this clip with Beth Miller from episode 74 from our conversation about succession planning. Too often, business owners wait too long to develop their plan and they don't involve the key employees. If the plan is in your head and not communicated, what good will it do? One of the key ideas Beth shared is recognizing how succession planning can be a retention tool to help improve your business value. When it comes to exit planning and being able to create that vision as an owner, what your life might look like. Mm -hmm after the sale or after you've retired from your business, either way, right? Exit in the sense of you're not part of the company anymore. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so difficult for people to think about what's next? The unknown. They haven't experienced it in the past. I think that there are, there are some individuals that are more uh, prone to looking into the future while there are others that are more about the here and now. So those individuals that that look more into the future and have a good support system around them. So if they're already involved, for instance, with some other activities, they could get more involved with those activities, right? The, The people that are have lived so much for their company are the ones that have a harder time letting go, at least in my experience. Um, the, the individual, uh, Dan in the book, um, Dan is, is somebody who had some, some activities, but didn't have as much time to do them. So he expanded those. And then he, his, personal situation was changing where he was becoming a grandfather. So he wanted to spend more time. So there was a, there was a personal reason for that as well. Um, And he was just very committed to making sure that not only does, was the exit good for him, but for his key employees as well. So that, you know, yeah, he, he had a, a very nice, cash windfall, but um, there, his key employees also uh, benefited from, from the sale as well. 
Yeah, and I have the same ethos of when I work with clients that we need to talk about the business readiness. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about the personal readiness. Yes. And a lot of times the personal readiness is sort of the afterthought, but I try to, I try to bring it forward yeah. because if they're talking with me, they probably already have decided at some level that they mm -hmm. want to start preparing their business for sale or preparing it for a, let's say an internal succession or, or mm -hmm. some sort of exit on the other side, right? What's yeah. coming in the next three years, five years, or right. one year can happen too. And we do have an assessment and you probably have tools too, but like we, we use an assessment where we call it the pre-score, which is a personal readiness to exit. Hmm, and okay. it boils it down into different attributes, like four key drivers. And so mm -hmm. they dovetail very nicely with what you're saying. And we can measure where are they in that continuum of readiness mm -hmm. and then talk about an action plan. What are those questions they need to be exploring? I have a husband and wife that are clients and the husband's the owner of the business, but the wife works in the business. And of course she's involved day to day mm -hmm. and she's sort of leaning towards being more ready than he is for some reasons. And it's been interesting to have that conversation too. And so a lot of times I think the value that advisors can have with a client that's contemplating is mm -hmm. being able to draw out these uncomfortable, yes. uncertain kinds yeah. of things. Like we're not a therapist, right? We're not no. a licensed <laughs> therapist, but <laughs> a lot of it is fear yes. too, right? We're yeah. getting older or fear of change. Yeah. So this, yeah, this kind of squishy place, this uncertain place, I think it is valuable to have a book like yours to be able to have the time to explore, right? Yeah. But it's also helpful to talk to someone. Yes. Yeah. I mean, most of my work is is asking the questions that they've never asked themselves or they've asked themselves, but it, it's never been in the forefront of their, their mind. So, yeah. And, it, yeah. and it gets it gets them to self-reflect on, you know, what what could be um, versus what is. Yeah. Well, I think if if you're a business owner. Whether, whether you're 40 years old or 60 years old, it, it really doesn't matter as it relates to succession planning. Succession planning is not just about you and your company, but it's about the people internally. And if you are focused on creating a path for the company, as well as creating a path for the employees Hopefully that will increase retention. And right now we've got we've got a huge talent war going out there. I mean, worse than we ever had in the, the last 10, 15 years. And we've been talking about talent war for, for a long time. But it's 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 really I mean, when I talk to to business owners now, the two things they talk about as a, the biggest challenge are talent and supply chain. So if you if you are if the employees know that there's a succession plan and that um, they're being developed as part of that that plan, you're more likely to retain them and retain them for a longer period of time. I hope you enjoyed today's Succession Stories Rewind, featuring clips from the first 100 shows. As I encourage all of my clients and my listeners, be purposeful. What did you hear that sparked some ideas for creating more value in your business? Maybe it was ensuring a successful succession process discussed with Beth Miller or multi-generational succession with Laird and Company or industrial innovation ideas inspired by American Crane with Karen Norheim or keeping an enterprise scorecard that Steve Peplin with Talon Products talked about. What are two to three things that you'll take action on? If you want to talk about your business, I can help you find clarity on a path forward. Set up some time with me at meetlauriebarkman.com. Through these conversations, we're creating an invaluable body of knowledge to benefit you. Support the show by becoming an official patron on Patreon. Tune in next week for more insights from transition to transaction. Until then, here's to your success.